the next talk, is, which is Ben Lipsky, which is a professor and microbiology coming from US and probably one of the most well-known person for an infection related to diabetic foot. And Ben, you will talk about diagnosis of chronic wound infections. Thank you very much, Finn and uh, Dilip, and thank you for inviting me. If you have an empty seat next to you, would you raise your hand so maybe some of these people can sit down? So there are some seats and if you want to fill in there. So you've heard a lot about uh, what the problem is. The problem is that we have a lot of wounds. The wounds have bugs in them. People think that they need to put uh, patients who have bugs in their wounds on antibiotics. Because antibiotics are overused, we have a problem with antibiotic resistance, and that's why uh, uh, we're hearing about the problem of how we solve that. So I think one of the key issues of dealing with this problem is coming to grips with the idea of how you diagnose wound infection. And I think that a lot of people, even specialists like you in the field, don't have a clear enough idea on this. So I hope at the end of this talk, you'll feel better about it. Now, you've seen something similar to this already from Finn, which is uh, what is a wound infection? And quite simply, there's a break in the skin caused by any number of things, be it pressure or, or trauma. Organisms that are on the skin, they may be resident flora that are normally there, like staph epidermidis, or they may be transient flora that have been put there by the nurse who came in previously and touched the patient with hands that had gram negatives from a previous patient. Those organisms get into the wound, begin to multiply, cause, they, they grow up in the wound, and they cause inflammation. Now, whether you get infection or not is related to three simple things. It's directly related to the number of microorganisms inoculated and their virulence, and inversely related to the host resistance. Now, you have this battle going on between pathogens and host defenses, and I sort of think of it this way, that at some point, one side's going to win out, and when the pathogens win out, we have infection. When your host resistance is able to hold back the pathogens, then we have colonization, which does not require antimicrobial therapy, either topical or systemic. Well, let's go back a few years. This uh, paper is 15 years old, and I like the slide because it looks at a very simple question. 63 consecutive patients with a variety of wound, uh, foot wounds. In the purple, you see patients who are clinically infected based upon what the uh, treating clinician thought uh, was, uh, inf whether the patient was infected or not, and what percentage had a positive culture. Well, not surprisingly, the majority did, although in some of the wounds, like diabetic uh, ischemic wounds, only 80% did. But flip that around and look at the patients who have a positive culture and ask what percentage were actually clinically infected, and you see rates as low as 20% on the venous ulcers and no higher than 90%. So a lot of uninfected wounds are being treated. So let me tell you what I think are some key issues that you need to understand about defining wound infection. The microorganisms replicate in the host tissue, overwhelming host defenses. We've talked about that. You get local tissue damage, and it certainly impairs wound healing. There's also a local host inflammatory response, which may then go on to be, become systemic, what we call the systemic uh, SIRS, the systemic uh, inflammatory response syndrome. There are special issues around microorganisms one needs to keep in mind, the type of pathogen, the site of replication, whether the pathogens have virulence factors, how diverse the organisms are, because often there's a group of organisms causing infection rather than a single one, the total number of organisms, and whether or not they're in a biofilm state. There are additional uh, in issues to take uh, into consideration. The presence of foreign bodies, local ischemia, immunological disturbances. And the key reason to define whether or not wound infection is present is because you do not need antimicrobial therapy if it's not, and you do if it is. And so that's why we're making a big issue of this. Now, are antibiotics being used for non-healing ulcers? You bet they are. Uh, just one of many studies I could show you. This happens to be a recent one from Norway. Even though they have a very low rate of antibiotic resistance in the Scandinavian countries, as Finn has pointed out, even there they do things wrong. This study done in 2008, 105 patients with, uh, who were referred by their primary care providers to a wound specialist because of a wound. These are the different kinds of wounds that they had, so the whole spectrum that you'll be seeing in your practices. 75% of these patients were given antibiotics. In 93% of the cases, they were systemic. Before they were referred for the wound uh, center, the wound center saw the patients and agreed in only one case, 1% 1 of the time. A lot of antibiotics being used unnecessarily. Now, do antibiotics help? So some people say, well, 
I know you guys in the infectious disease world don't want me to use antibiotics, but I think they make the wounds better. Well, there's lots of data to show that that is not the case. Let me just show you two examples. This is a, a, a Cochrane uh, systematic review that we did recently that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association a few months ago. We looked at all the available studies looking at antimicrobial therapy given for venous leg ulcers. And what it showed was there's absolutely no evidence to support that if you give antibiotic therapy to a patient with a venous leg ulcer, that that wound will get better faster, that that wound will fail to become clinically infected. Similarly, we just recently published a paper reviewing the evidence on diabetic foot infections. We asked the question, in diabetic foot infections, antibiotics are to treat infection, not to heal wounds. We did a non-systematic search of PubMed going back to 1951 when PubMed started through November of 2014. Our conclusion based on that available published evidence suggests there's no reason to prescribe antibiotic therapy for a clinically uninfected wound either as prophylaxis against it becoming infected or in the hope that it'll somehow miraculously hasten healing of the wound. It doesn't happen. So that puts you, the clinicians, on the horns of a dilemma. Ouch. So what I mean by that is if you fail to give antibiotics and the wound was actually infected, you run the risk that the infection is worsening and perhaps it'll lead, in the case of a diabetic foot infection, to an amputation. On the other hand, if you treat the uninfected wound with antibiotics, you incur the cost of therapy, you incur all the risks that are drug-related. Systemic or topical drugs can cause a variety of adverse effects and medication interactions. And you drive the development of antibiotic resistance that you heard uh, uh, Dilip speak about so elegantly just before me. So defining infection is key. How do we define infection? Well, for about 50 years, studies were done that came to the conclusion that if you grew greater than 10 to the fifth colony forming units per gram of tissue, that that meant that the wound was truly infected. This is a deep biopsy of, an infected, uh, of a wound that might be infected. There is evidence that if you have a burn wound with that degree of colonization, that your chances of developing bloodstream infection is increased. There is evidence that if you have that number of organisms and you put a flap over it, then your chances that that flap will fail will increase. I've just told you all the evidence in the world for greater than 10 to the fifth. And yet you all believe in it because you've all been taught to believe in it. There's virtually no evidence for wounds. And there are problems with using this standard for diagnosing wound infection. There are very few clinical microbiology labs that will do it. Can you raise your hand if your clinical micro lab will do quantitative microbiology, tell you the exact number of organisms in a wound? Mine won't. I see one hand, two. So, and yet we think that's what we have to do. We're not doing it. They won't do it for us. So here's our gold standard, 10 to the fifth organisms per gram of tissue. It requires a biopsy, which takes some skills, causes some discomfort, requires rapid transfer to the laboratory. The laboratory has to know how to do it, be willing to do it. The organisms that grow vary in their virulence. The results take days, so you have to decide today whether the patient's going to get antibiotics. Three or four days from now doesn't help. If they're on antibiotics, you get false negatives. If the wound is contaminated by you or someone along the way, when it goes to the micro lab, you get false positives. We only grow what we know how to grow, and now that we can do uh, genetic testing and molecular testing, we know we're missing all kinds of organisms. We only identify perhaps 10% of all the organisms. Biofilm communities, you can't tell by a culture whether there's biofilm. And when we say this is the gold standard, we say compared to what? What are we comparing it to if we hold that up? And we don't have any answer for that. So what do societies that have to come up with answers to how to define a wound infection do? They all take a slightly different route. So here you see some organizations that say, well, it's the presence of pus or two or more signs of inflammation. Other societies say, no, you have to have fever and pain and lymphangitis, rapid uh, increase in wound size, or you have to have, as many people in the wound healing world believe, so-called secondary signs. They say, we don't think that the classical findings that go back to uh, the Greeks of uh, rubra, cala, dolor, uh, and so on are very useful. But if you look for things like serous exudate, delayed healing, discolored or friable granulation tissue, foul odor, wound breakdown, that will tell you whether the wound is infected. And finally, microbiologists will stick to their guns and say, no, it's got to be a biopsy with 10 to the fifth. 
Well, let's look at what information is available. Sue Gardner has done some interesting study uh, in the nursing field. She's looked at diagnosing diabetic foot infection, comparing microbial findings against clinical findings. She looked at tissue biopsies of 64 patients with diabetic foot ulcers. She defines infection as the growth of greater than 10 to the 6th, slightly different colony forming units, and she found it was present in 39% of the patients. And then she said, how well did that correlate with the presence of all these findings I just told you about, these clinical findings? Now, that red line is flipping a coin. So if you asked your five-year-old whether this sign is associated with infection or not, it would follow that red line over there. And that's exactly where all these findings are. And I have to say, as the chair of the IDSA Guideline Committee for Diabetic Foot Infections, I've put up where our definition is. It does no better than the ADA's definition or any of the other definitions. So what we have here is a very poor receiver operating curve. If you combine all 12 of these, you can get a receiver operating curve of about 0.65, which is at best moderately helpful. Diagnosing infection is even more difficult when you're dealing with ischemic and neuropathic wounds. You don't have uh, pain because uh, you're neuropathic, or you may have pain because you're neuropathic. You don't have erythema if you don't get any blood flow. You don't have warmth if you don't have any blood flow. You may not get induration if you don't have adequate blood flow. And if you're immunocompromised, then you don't have the classic findings of inflammation. And there are a variety of other things that can cause all of the signs and symptoms that we typically take to mean that a wound is infected. Well, how about laboratory tests? You've told me that I can't necessarily trust the micro lab and I can't necessarily trust my clinical exam. Surely there's a lab test that can help me. White cell count, very insensitive. If you happen to have leukocytosis, you probably have a severe infection, but less than 10 to 15 percent of patients with a diabetic foot infection do. How about the SED rate? SED rate actually is useful in really one indication, and that is if you're looking for osteomyelitis. If it's very high, greater than 70, it is associated with the presence of underlying bone infection, and you can follow a dropping SED rate over time. Other than that, it doesn't help you very much. A variety of other laboratory tests have been looked at. Among them, CRP and procalcitonin, particularly when combined, can, in one study anyway, give you a reasonable sensitivity and specificity. Other types of uh, uh, blood tests have been looked at, none of which have been found to be very useful. So in this setting, the Journal of the American Medical Association decided they need to ask this question and put it to their rational clinical examination study board. Does this patient have an infection in a chronic wound? And in 2012, they went through the literature. And this is what they found. They used as their reference point the standard deep tissue culture with greater than 10 to the fifth or the growth of, it, growth of any beta hemolytic streptococci because those are not normal skin flora and when they get in a wound they usually do cause infection. They were able to identify 15 relevant studies, nine of which they rated as low quality through 2011. There were a total of a little over 1,000 wounds. They were not evaluated by specific wound type. One of the things that they pointed out, and I was very glad to see this because it's one of the things I always speak about when I talk about this topic, is the prior probability of infection really helps you to know whether a test is useful or not. If you see a patient with pus pouring out, who's febrile, who has all the signs and symptoms of infection, no test is going to convince you he's not infected. Don't do any tests. On the other hand, if you see a wound that is so bland looking that you think it's less than 10% chance that it's infected, then I would not be persuaded by any of the available tests that we have that it is infected. It's only the patients in the middle where you truly don't know, you're at equipoise, that any of these tests are very helpful for you. None of these studies did serial assessments. Their main results, based on the limited data, were that classic findings of pus and inflammation were not especially helpful. Symptoms, uh, among the symptoms, the, the fact that you have an ulcer or an increase in pain uh, with that ulcer increases the likelihood ratio that infection's present. And among the signs, if you have no serous exudate or a rapidly healing wound, you probably don't have an infection. They also thought that a Levine swab was similar to a wound biopsy. I'm going to take uh, exception to that. We have a massive study called Codify that was just completed with 400 uh, patients who had both swabs and tissues, showing that's clearly not true, that a tissue biopsy is much more accurate than a swab, but I won't go into that. That's what their finding was. Uh, and to diagnose a rule-out infection, they felt you still needed to get a deep tissue biopsy and look for growth of high numbers of organisms. Now, what about more modern ways of looking at things? What's come about since that review in 2012? Well, there's a lot of interesting things. 
there are a variety of markers of inflammation and infection you can look for. If you look in a wound, you can detect volatile uh, substances, uh, gases, metal oxide polymers. You can detect a variety of different uh, kinds of enzymes. You can detect changes in pH, which turn out to be quite interesting. You can find proteins and metabolites that might suggest infection. And finally, there are new methods of detecting microorganisms. Uh, new generation sequencing, uh, fish, microassays, PCR, and Malditoff, which is now being used widely, where within hours rather than days, we can tell you whether there's an organism and what the organism is. So we're beginning to ask the question, is wound fluid the window of the wound? Can we take some of the fluid from the wound and determine whether there's an inflammatory response that suggests infection going on? This is an exudate of extracellular fluid within a micro environment that's caused mostly by vasodilatation. Wound fluid has the capacity to degrade growth factors and increase inflammation. And as I mentioned, pH seems to be a key factor. Uh, metalli uh, matrix metalloproteins are sensitive to changes in pH. pH may influence survival and virulence of microbes. Different organisms present, are present at different pH levels. Antibiotics may be more active at certain pH levels, and decreased pH levels are associated with improved healing. Here's just one example of uh, a study looking at pH. You can see that in the 45 patients that uh, were clinically infected versus the uh, 64 patients that were not, the pH level, uh, the, the level of lactate, lactate being lactic acid, of course, is associated with acidosis, was much higher. And when those wounds healed, the level of uh, lactate dropped down. So this is a, a suggestion that we might be looking at something like lactate in wounds. What about bacterial counts in wound fluids? A paper that was uh, recently published a few months ago looked at that. And what they found is that there's across chronic venous leg ulcers and diabetic foot ulcers, if you categorize them as to whether they're clinically infected or clinically uninfected, it's a scattergram. There were really no differences. So the presence of a certain number of uh, bacteria did not correlate with the presence of clinical signs of infection. Uh, it's also, they looked at whether certain organisms were present in infected wounds more commonly than in uninfected wounds and found that there were no difference between them either. What about enzymes? I mentioned to you that there are a variety of interesting enzymes in wound fluid. A study that uh, was just published uh, four weeks ago looked at 81 patients with chronic, uh, mostly chronic and a few acute wounds a substantial percentage of whom had diabetes. They measured the levels of antibacterial enzymes secreted in the wounds that are made by host polymorphonucleoleukocytes, the main response to acute infection. So they were looking at myeloperoxidase, human neutrophil elastase, lysozyme, cathepsin G. The diagnosis of infection in this study was a positive wound swab culture, which was present in 36% of cases. I would not accept that. Had I reviewed this paper, it would have gotten no further than that, but that's what they used. No relationship was found between swab, culture result, and the clinical judgment of clinical infection, which you've heard me say a few times from these studies. And when they looked at the enzymes compared to culture results, the highest sensitivity was with myeloperoxidase, the highest positive predictive value with lysozyme, and a variety of models developed ROC curves that were pretty good with 0.74 um, as the um, uh, receiver operating curve characteristic. Now, another interesting thing that's been done is in, in Nîmes, France, uh, Soto and his colleagues have been doing some very interesting studies with diabetic foot ulcers, looking at the presence of genes in Staph aureus. They do DNA microassays and multiplex real-time PCR, and they're able to rapidly find genes that encode for resistance as well as for virulence factors. They found that a combination of five genes in Staph aureus, if they're present, they accurately discriminated wounds that were infected versus uninfected. How did they differentiate those two? Well, they did the standard uh, wound uh, scoring that, that we rec recommend in the uh, diabetic foot infection uh, guidelines, but they also did something that I think is even more useful. They followed the patients over time to see what happened, and they didn't treat the ones that came up as clinically uninfected, and they found that, in fact, they didn't become infected if they uh, didn't have this combination of five genes. They then followed up that study with a second study which looked at 75 uninfected and 120 infected diabetic foot ulcers, and they found that the combination of certain clones of Staph aureus were associated with no infection and good healing, and the presence of other kinds of genes were also associated with good outcomes. So 
if we can begin to find these genes rapidly within an hour or two, then your micro lab may be able to report back to you, the, this patient has a staph aureus, this staph aureus is or is not resistant to methicillin or any other drug you want to know about, and it has genes that are highly associated with this being infectious and would go on to produce a problem. That's what we really would like from our micro labs, and that's coming. What else is new in the field? Well, there are a few interesting things. You can assess through photographs as well as infrared thermography. Uh, and in this study that was uh, just reported a few months ago, 38 patients with diabetic foot-related complications were looked at. They used this photographic device that you see in the upper right-hand corner and an uh, a, uh, infrared thermometer. And they were able to show that if you looked for a difference of 2.2 degrees centigrade between the same spot on two, on two different feet, if the patient has both feet, you call that a hot spot, and that was associated with a very high correlation of the wound being clinically infected with a sensitivity of greater than 60 and a specificity of greater than 80. This is early on, but, but promising. Similar kind of thing is looking for autofluorescence imaging. So uh, this group, uh, uh, and this was just published two weeks ago, uh, looked at a handheld non-contact, we want that because Dilip wouldn't be happy if you had anything to touch the wound, real-time visualization of bacteria in a wound. If you look uh, in the top, uh, at, on the left side of, this, uh, of the slide, it shows what a standard white light, the kind of white you see in an exam room, what the wound looks like. But under these special fluorescence, you can see where it's red. That's a very high concentration of microorganisms. So this is before debridement on the top and then after debridement on the bottom where the wound looks pretty good and many of us would be happy to send that patient home off antibiotics because it looks pretty good. In fact, it's teeming with microorganisms. I would have actually liked to see it the other way around, but the fact is that uh, uh, that's what this shows is the presence of bacteria. So let me finish by coming back to the question that I was asked to discuss and uh, started with. How should we diagnose wound infection? We've used this gold standard of a deep tissue culture with greater than 10 to the fifth organisms, coliniformity units per gram of tissue or the growth of any beta strep. I've mentioned to you the problems with this, but I haven't been able to give you currently anything that's yet better than this. I've talked about the fact that you can swab a wound, you can also aspirate or curette a wound, you can do molecular microbiology. Time didn't allow me to get into that too much, but the work by Soto and his group is quite interesting. I've talked about the classic signs and symptoms and the fact that they don't hold up as well as we'd like, and the secondary signs and symptoms, which also don't hold up very well. Serum inflammatory markers, some are suggestive, none are really very uh, positive uh, to date. Wound fluid enzymes and inflammatory markers are very interesting, and I think it may be an area that uh, will develop in the future. Thermography, I've mentioned to you, I'm very interested in looking at that. Autofluorescence, a very interesting new uh, thing to be looking at. And I haven't had time to talk with you about it, but there are actually some new advanced imaging tests. So this is where we stand. I think we still have to use this deep tissue as the uh, gold standard, but I think that things will be changing in the near future, and I thank you for your attention.